Metroid is a series beloved by many. The first game, released in 1986, featured huge, sprawling caves to explore and interesting power-ups to collect, a feature which Super Metroid went on to perfect, and remains one of the greatest and most important games of all time. The whole concept of a Metroidvania stems from these games. Even the first Castlevania game to adopt this concept and coin the term Metroidvania came three years after Super Metroid was released. Then, in 2002, we got Metroid Prime, which brought the franchise into 3D and became the seventh best-selling game on the GameCube, with much critical acclaim. The team behind the game, Retro Studios, went on to release two more games in the series, but we haven't seen a new core entry in the Metroid Prime franchise since 2007. Now, in 2017, Nintendo revealed that they were working on Metroid Prime 4, but that Retro Studios wouldn't be involved. Then, just a year and a half later, they revealed that the project would be scrapped and that Retro would be taking over. But since then, we've heard precious little about this game. Today, I'd like to talk about Metroid Prime 4, dissecting rumors, speculation, even industry gossip to figure out what we can expect from this highly anticipated game. But first, let's start with a little context on Retro Studios, how they began and where they've been, so that way we can more honestly predict where they're going. Also, if you enjoy this video, please consider giving it a like or even subscribing to my channel. It really, really helps out a lot. Thank you. Retro Studios was founded by industry veteran Jeff Spangenberg in partnership with Nintendo to create titles for their up-and-coming GameCube. Uh, let me introduce you to a new baby. <laughs> like all babies, it's small. <laughs> Nintendo wanted Spangenberg and Retro to create games for an older demographic. Spangenberg previously founded Iguana Games, the studio behind Turok, the really crappy South Park FPS everyone remembers, and their greatest contribution to humanity, NBA Jam. Technically Midway developed this game for arcades, but Iguana Games did handle the console ports. Basically Jeff was… problematic at best. The studio, which didn't even have access to GameCube development kits at the time, started working on four projects, and the company quickly grew from 25 employees to 120 employees, and according to an old IGN article I found, up to a whopping 200 employees. In most cases, growing this big this quickly isn't a good sign for a studio. But using the experience he had as an industry veteran, Spangenberg began hiring other well-respected game developers. They came from Origin, from Endspace, even id Software. The problem was that Jeff was reportedly never at the studio, delegating the work he should have been doing, you know, managing production, to other people. On top of this, one day someone discovered a website being run on one of Retro's own servers called Sinful Summer, which was full of pictures of scantily clad women hanging out at pool parties that Spangenberg was throwing at his own house. After this, Nintendo said enough was enough, and they secured $1 million in Retro stock, essentially buying the company out from under Spangenberg. He departed shortly after. What's hilarious is that when he left, he went on to found the studio that made The Guy Game. This game also got Spangenberg in hot water because one of the models used in the game was underage at the time, and they actually had to stop selling the game. Instead, releasing a DVD version called The Guy Game Game Over, which simply ripped footage from the game, leaving out the underage girl. So, yeah, Jeff Spangenberg is a regular Randy Pitchford. To replace him, Nintendo brought in Michael Kelbaugh, former head of Q&A and product testing at Nintendo of America, to be Retro Studios' new CEO. A position he has kept ever since. At one point, Retro, which is based in Austin, Texas, was visited by Shigeru Miyamoto, with Satoru Iwata, the not yet president of Nintendo, acting as his translator. They came by to look at the four games Retro was working on to see how the millions of dollars Nintendo was pouring into the new studio were being put to use. They were… not happy. Miyamoto reportedly hated three of the games they were working on. One, a car action game similar to Twisted Metal, to which he reportedly said, quote, Why would you put guns on cars? Don't cars crash into each other? Isn't that what they do? If only somebody had the cojones to say, No Miyamoto-san, they throw shells at each other. Another game they were working on was an American football game, which, after a year of development, Retro still didn't have anything rendered on the screen, and an RPG called Ravenblade, which actually was shown at E3 2001 before it was ultimately cancelled. 
But apparently Miyamoto saw something in their fourth game, a sci-fi action adventure with three lead female characters. Him and Awada returned to their hotel room to discuss amongst themselves before reporting back to Retro that they needed to cancel the other three games immediately, fire half their staff, and put all their efforts into the action adventure game. Oh, and they were being given the Metroid IP. Developing the game was stressful. At the time, the previous Metroid game was Super Metroid, which was released back in 1994. The first question the studio had to decide was whether to make the game first or third person. Shigeru Miyamoto was heavily involved with the development of the game, and Retro Studios game director Mark Bassini said, quote, At the time, Miyamoto felt that shooting in third person was not very intuitive. Other issues included figuring out how to get Samus' signature Morph Ball ability into the game. Bassini said, quote, We use Super Metroid as our kind of bible, but as we've been sold on the concept of first person, we couldn't see how to put the ball into the title. In fact, it was actually on the chopping block for a long time. We thought that concentrating on the exploration through platforming might be good enough. But Miyamoto insisted that if they couldn't get the transition between the Morph Ball and first person, then they shouldn't even make the game. Quote Pacini once more on the Morph Ball, it took us a few months to get that correct, and that was pretty scary, as it was one of the first milestones we had to reach. And thanks to our engineers, we managed to create something that when Miyamoto saw it, he said, okay, on the project. That was huge. At one point early in development, Miyamoto suggested to Retro, quote, what if Samus could switch her head and have a bug's head? Retro's developers left the meeting extremely confused. And at the time, I remember going back to our office and saying, switching heads? What does that have to do with Metroid? He wasn't asking if she had the head of a fly. He was talking about the mechanic of altered perception as a whole. And from that, the visor system came to be, where uh, Samus could see different things with different visors and, and use that as a puzzle-solving element. And the scan visor, which is actually a huge staple in the series, was actually a last-minute addition. Nintendo kept telling Retro that something was still missing and suggested the idea of scanning things, which was very popular in Japan at the time. Kelbaugh admits that the team found the concept really boring, but they tried to make it more interesting by adding a collectible element to it, providing players with information on how to beat enemies and clues on how to progress. This paid off though, as the scan visor became a key feature in the series. The last nine months of Metroid Prime's development featured some of the nastiest crunch the industry has seen, with employees working 80 to 100 hours a week and it left them completely drained. But when it was finally released, Metroid Prime proved to the world that an unknown Western studio could take one of Nintendo's most beloved franchises and revolutionize the series. The game currently holds a 97 on Metacritic and sold close to 3 million copies. And considering it was on the GameCube, which only sold a total of 22 million copies, is incredible. Nintendo ordered Retro to start making a sequel right away, and the rest they say is history. After finishing the Metroid Prime series and the compilation disc, Metroid Prime Trilogy for the Wii, they went on to make Donkey Kong Country Returns, and Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze, as well as helping on Mario Kart 7, all of which were very well received. But rumors were abounding about what they were working on next. Tropical Freeze originally released on the Wii U in 2014, and a port was brought to the Switch in 2018, but surely the entire team at Retro wasn't working for four years on a port of a game. Rumors circled that they had a few games in development, with many stating that things at the studio were a little rocky. And then there were the rumors that they were working on a Star Fox racing game. The game was said to have a story and bosses a la Diddy Kong Racing, but that the races would be more fast-paced, like F-Zero. Now, obviously this game hasn't been officially announced, and we've heard nothing else about it since these rumors. But Star Fox characters did make an appearance in the Ubisoft game Starlink Battle for Atlas, which includes a racing mode. So, it's very possible that someone saw footage of this and assumed it was a Star Fox racing game. Although, this wouldn't explain how Retro was associated with the project. Either way, it was announced at E3 2017 that Metroid Prime 4 was in development. Although, it was confirmed that Retro would not be working on the project. Then the internet noticed some job listings on LinkedIn, talking about an unannounced IP, first-person shooter slash adventure exclusive to the Nintendo Switch. People put two and two together, and it wasn't hard to see that this was probably Metroid Prime 4. And Eurogamer was able to confirm through multiple sources that Bandai Namco Singapore, a studio who had worked on the previously cancelled Star Wars 1313, was working on the project. 
It seems though that Nintendo actually had multiple studios across the world working on different aspects of the game. And then, in January of 2019, Nintendo shocked the world by announcing in a short video on their YouTube channel that the game's development was not living up to the standards they expected, and they would be starting over with Retro Studios back at the helm. Imran Khan, a former senior editor at Game Informer, tweeted once saying that Metroid Prime 4 was struggling due to it being worked on in so many different studios, and that Nintendo thought the best way to solve the problem was to put it back under one roof. Retro apparently put together a pitch for Nintendo, wanting to work on the series again, and Nintendo gave the franchise back. Considering we've heard nothing else since, it's likely that whatever Retro Studios had been working on for the last six years has been scrapped. And when taking into account the usual development time for Metroid Prime games, it's likely we won't see this game released until sometime in 2021 at the earliest, which would actually coincide with the franchise's 35th anniversary something I think Nintendo and Retro would love to capitalize on. And it seems that the team on Retro has some good talent behind it. The series producer, Kensuke Takanabe, has been attached to the project since its original announcement back in 2017. Roughly half of the core team that worked on the Metroid Prime series left Retro Studios in 2008, including their game director Mark Bassini, who left to form Armature Studio, who would go on to make ReCore. But reports indicate that half of the original team is still working at Retro. In September, Retro acquired Victor Van Heck as a lead external atmosphere artist, who has worked on the Killzone series and Rise Son of Rome. And back in October, they hired Kyle Heffley as a lead character artist. Heffley's credits include nine years at 343 Studios, where he did the modeling for Halo 4 and 5. Personally, I'd love to see what he can bring to the space pirates of the Metroid franchise. However, while Retro clearly has some skilled people, their website actually lists a lot of openings, including positions for a lead graphics engineer, a lead animator, and a lead VFX artist. So it's very possible that this game might take even more years to be completed. As far as what we can expect gameplay-wise, I think it's pretty safe to assume we're going to see a bunch of series staples returning. Of course we're going to see some first-person gameplay. Of course we're going to see Metroidvania elements of collecting different power-ups and abilities to progress in different areas. And of course, we're gonna see some scanning. I think the more interesting and also kind of obvious thing to talk about is control scheme. Are we getting motion controls? For Metroid Prime 3 and the trilogy released on the Wii, it reportedly took Retro a whole year to figure out how those controls would work. Are we going to see the Joy-Cons used in a similar fashion, or will they be returning to a more standard control scheme for first-person shooter games? Personally, I'd like to see a more traditional control scheme, as I'm pretty over motion controls. And it's wild to remember, but in the original Metroid Prime, which used the GameCube controller, you had to pull the R trigger just to aim around, since the C-Stick was mapped to changing your weapons. The game compensated for this by having a lock-on system, although this seems really outdated by today's first-person shooter mechanics. But hey, Splatoon, another Nintendo franchise with shooting mechanics, features gyroscopic aiming, so maybe we'll see that here. I hope not. Also, I'm really interested in seeing what Retro does in regards to the scale of the game. In recent years, Nintendo's big tentpole IPs, Mario and Zelda, have seen major increases in their scale, and have somewhat redefined what the franchises can do. I know it's become a little cliche to say you want a franchise to receive the Breath of the Wild treatment, but uh... Heck yeah, give Metroid some of that. Metroid games normally see Samus running between different regions on one planet, or even different planets entirely. This allows for varied environments for her to explore. It would be rad to have multiple planets that she could use her ship to hop between at any time. Say you're on the lava planet, but you can't progress any farther, so better check out the forest planet. Over here you find the Varia suit, which lets you survive in hot environments, but you can't progress any farther here, so now we gotta go back and explore deeper on the lava planet. This is all pretty standard for the series, really, but letting her ship touch down on multiple locations on the planet and acting as a fast travel system might be a nice touch of modernization for the series. Also, the scanning, which became a huge staple in the Metroid Prime series, could also be expanded. Nowadays, many games incorporate audio recordings or even ship logs to help flesh out the universe. What if everything you could scan was also fully voice acted? It kind of seems like the Metroid franchise has been trying to add more characters lately, and this could go a long way to make them feel more interesting. I mean, don't have Samus talk, because nobody wants that again. Why am I still alive? Also, maybe more open environments. I'm not suggesting just to drop an open world onto the Metroid formula, it's always kind of had that. 
but usually the big sprawling map is broken up into smaller condensed rooms, with doors working as gatekeeping and loading zones. But hey, it's 2020 baby, we've got the technology, let's experiment a little bit, get crazy! Now, I know there are some examples of bigger areas in the Prime franchise, and it's a super controversial opinion to ask for an open-world Metroid game, and I'll probably take some heat for even suggesting it. And ultimately, I don't even know if I really want that, but it's something worth looking into. We haven't had a new Metroid Prime game in 13 years at this point, and games have come a long way since then. This game can't just be another Fallout 3 to a Fallout 4 where only the graphics update, but the systems behind the game are from two generations ago. As far as the story goes, of course we're going to see some of the same stuff, but I wouldn't have it any other way. I'm talking Space Pirates, I'm talking the Galactic Federation, and of course, the series namesake, Metroids. Now, I think it's probably safe to assume this game will chronologically fall after Metroid Prime 3 and before Metroid 2 Return of Samus or Metroid Samus Returns, which are the same game, and coincidentally, one of these is the only good Metroid game to come out in the last decade. It's important to talk about where Metroid Prime 3 left us. Samus had finally destroyed the planet Phase, which wiped out all the corrupting phase on in the universe, and was seen flying off into hyperspace. In the 100% completion ending, we see another ship pursuing her. It was confirmed by series producer Kensuke Takanabe that this was Silux, one of the rival bounty hunters featured in Metroid Prime Hunters. He also makes a cameo at the ending of Metroid Prime Federation Force, stealing a baby Metroid from the Galactic Federation. If you missed this fact, don't worry, you're forgiven. Nobody actually played this game. And while not much is known about Silux, apart from the fact that he hates the Galactic Federation and by association, Samus, his weapon, the Shock Coil, is actually a prototype developed by the Galactic Federation. And in the cutscene at the end of Federation Force, it's been noted by many that his hands look very human, although this may have just been the art style chosen for the game. Some have theorized that he was a former Galactic Federation soldier turned rogue, or maybe some form of experimentation was done on him, resulting in his hatred for them. It's been shown across the series that while they certainly aren't as outright evil as the Space Pirates, the Galactic Federation doesn't have its hands clean when it comes to pursuing slightly dubious research. This could build into a cool backstory for Silux, and Takanabe has said that he would like to see Silux and Samus' rivalry built up in the next game. In Super Metroid, because Samus is the first thing the baby Metroid sees, it comes to see her as its mother, and later even sacrifices itself to protect her. Maybe this Metroid sees Silux as its parent, and he will raise it to help destroy the Federation. We've been shown that Metroids can grow into some truly terrifying monsters once they get past their cute phase. Maybe this baby eventually reaches Queen Metroid status, with Silux riding on top trying to 360 no-scope people. That'd be crazy. Or hey, maybe Silex just breeds a ton of Metroids and lets them loose. Maybe he teams up with the Space Pirates. Maybe Ridley comes back again. Just kidding, of course Ridley comes back again. It's important to note that Retro Studios really didn't have the intention of working on another Metroid Prime game, so they really could do anything here. We knew that Prime was going to be a trilogy, um, and that there was only going to be three, right about the time we started Metro Prime 2. So we knew. The one thing we can expect about this game is that we won't see it anytime soon. Like I said before, I think the earliest this game is going to release is going to be 2021. Which would be awesome, but I wouldn't be surprised to see this game slip to 2022. Which would see Retro not release a new game for 8 years. Either way, I'd rather see them take their time and nail it. The Metroid franchise is one of my favorites, and one I definitely feel hasn't seen enough love. The Metroid Prime Trilogy was a fantastic series of games, and while I was excited to see what a new team would do with it, I'm also relieved to hear that it's back in the hands of the developer who made it amazing in the first place. I hope that regardless of whatever was going on at Retro in the last six years, they are re-energized to deliver a fantastic new Metroid game. I'm actually excited to see what they do with storytelling and gameplay, because there's a lot of old stuff for them to pull on in the Metroid franchise, and a lot of new concepts in the gaming industry that didn't exist in the landscape 13 years ago. I guess what I'm trying to say is... God, I hope this game delivers. Hey, thank you very much for watching my video on the history of Retro as a company and what I think we can expect from Metroid Prime 4, which is a game I'm very excited for. 
If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing to the channel and also giving this video a like. It really helps this video's visibility on YouTube. Also, I'm currently unemployed, so I'm focusing all my time on making these videos. But if you are able to help me out, I do now have a Patreon, where I post some exclusive content every month. And speaking of content, I also do a weekly gaming news talk show in the style of ESPN's Around the Horn called Around the Monitor that we record live every Thursday on twitch.tv slash kingkaiser, which I'll put a link to below. You can watch along and vote for who you think is making the best argument on whatever topics are being presented that week. And we also have a Discord where you can keep up with us in whatever videos we're creating and even talk to us about, well, really whatever you want. We're still very small and I'm unemployed, so I've got the time. Anyways, thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed yourself. And until next time, have a wonderful day.